Well, this week we begin a new series, and it may feel not so new because it's the Ends of the Earth Part 3, and we just finished Ends of the Earth Part 2, but it, I wanted to frame it as a new series because we are entering Paul's third missionary journey, and so we're seeing some distinct changes between what takes place and in, the, in the life and the, of the church as it grows out, and as we see the work of the Holy Spirit as the church expands through Asia Minor, through, through Greece, and as we see the interaction and the work that God is doing. Often when we think of the expansion of the gospel, it's easy to think of the Apostle Paul and these others who had it all together and they knew it all, Peter and Paul and these great names of, that we know as men of faith. But not everybody always has it all together. We have to be, make sure that wherever we are in our spiritual journey, that we remain teachable. And so as we start off in the first part of our series today, we're going to be looking at a, at a teachable teacher. You know, I've encountered some teachable teachers in my life. When I went to seminary at Columbia International University, CIU, there was, uh, at the time, living in Columbia, Robertson McQuilkin. He was the son of Robert McQuilkin, who was the founding president of Columbia Bible College, now CIU. Uh, and because he was the, the president of the university, he was uh, taking care of his wife, who had Alzheimer's at the time, and he lived nearby. But one thing that was clear is he was a great teacher. We actually used some of his books in our class. Understanding and Applying the Bible was the, the book of hermeneutics, uh, which was so foundational. If I had one class I would ever teach anybody, it would be biblical hermeneutics because it's how to correctly interpret and apply the scripture. And that would solve so many problems. And so he was a good teacher and he wrote excellent books on missions and biblical hermeneutics. And he was a lifelong learner who learned from anybody. He's writing these books that are training seminary students, but he was a guy who could learn from anybody. He told stories about how he would talk with the trash collectors in his neighborhood, and he would learn important things about a wide variety of to topics. And so you think of, oh, what does this guy with his uh, doctorate, what can he learn from a trash collector? Well, his attitude wasn't, oh, I have nothing to learn from him, but I can learn from anybody. So whether it was the trash collector or whether it was the elderly neighbor that he encountered as he was walking through the neighborhood, he exhibited the model of being a lifelong learner. The funny thing is, is I didn't have to look to that seminary professor to see that. I had my own dad. My dad, uh, you know, as I've told you before, he grew up, had to leave home when he was 14 because he was the son of a sharecropper. He had to go and live on another farm so that he could have money to, well, so that the people that he was farming for, working for, would pay for his school books and clothing and that type of thing. And then he would go back over the summer and take the money that he earned working to help out his family. But he went on to join the, the, the army as a 17-year-old and, and participated in World War II. And then uh, in order not to be a grunt, uh, he uh, joined the Navy to, uh, 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 during the Korean War. Uh, but, and after that, he graduated and went on to become a physical therapist. And so he was a, a lifelong learner through his experiences as a, as a poor son of a sharecropper to the military, to his profession. But he was always learning always learning. And so dad was a baseball player, and my brother was a really good baseball player, and so as the youngest, it was like, I played baseball, but, you know, it wasn't my thing when you got a, a dad who's really, who almost went pro until he hurt his shoulder, and then a brother who was playing in his college, high school and college team, so I, I just didn't do that. I loved football, and I eventually started wrestling. But you know the thing is, is that my dad, when I didn't go the route of baseball the way that he did, I quit playing baseball and started to wrestle, that man learned all about wrestling. He wanted to know what it was because even though it wasn't his thing, he was wanting to learn from a standpoint of relating to me, his youngest son who had different interests from him. We all have things that we know and things that we can learn. And it's okay to share the things that you know, but if you do so to the exclusion of being a learner, then you're setting yourself up for problems. We want to have that posture of teachability. And you can do that by asking good questions and listening carefully. And those are some things that are helpful because it's a critical component for anyone who wants to increase their effectiveness in any area. And for us as Christ followers, having that teachable spirit, being a learner, will help us to be effective in communicating the gospel as effective teachers. 
because as Christ followers, we want to share the good news that we have experienced, and so that makes us functionally teachers. God has us something to say about that as we start our new series, and as we pick up in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 18, verses 23 through 28, we're going to see how God uses someone who has a teachable spirit for his glory. Let's pray. Father, as we open up your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be aligning our hearts with the truth of your word so that we can apply it in our lives. I pray, Father, that we would be teachable and learning, and even as we do that, you could use that in our lives so that we might be able to help others to come to know Jesus and to be teachers ourselves. Guide us as we open up your word this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, one of the, um, the main idea that I want you to take away from today's message is that one's ability is only as good as one's teachability. I'll say that again. One's ability is only as good as one's teachability. Because you'll see a lot of people that have a lot of ability. They have a lot of skills. We look around us and we see people that really have high-level skills in a wide variety of areas but their ability is only as good as their teachability because unless they can take that ability and learn how to apply it appropriately, it's just a bunch of head information or it's a big ego trip. But when we see somebody who is teachable and very effective, they're learning how to take that information and apply it appropriately in order to mobilize and help others and to have a, a lasting impact. So that's why it's important as we look at today's message to remember that main idea of one's ability is only as good as one's teachability because if we're not teachable, all the ability in the world will not help us in having a, a lasting kingdom impact. Good, good uh, thing that we need to do is to give a little bit of a review from last week in order to set things up from this week because um, last week we went through verse 23 and this week we start with verse 23. But last week we saw that Paul had gone to Corinth and we saw that he was dealing with some conflicts in Corinth. And in that conflict in Corinth we saw that Paul was developing strong connections with his fellow believers, uh, fellow tent makers, Ananias, uh, excuse me, Aquila and Priscilla. And so they were encouraging one another in their trade, even as they were expanding the gospel. Then we saw that Silas and Timothy arrived, and Paul turned his attention to the word. And as he began to preach more, there was a polarizing of opinions about him. Some of Paul, to some, Paul's preaching evoked opposition and reviling. But for others, his preaching resulted in hearing, believing, and being baptized. They heard, they believed and put their faith in Jesus Christ, and then they were baptized. They went public, of, with, uh, made a public expression of that internal commitment that they had made to Jesus Christ. And so there was that progression, and so there was a, a, a differences of opinion. And then we also saw that there were some baseless complaints against Paul for wrongdoing and vicious crimes, which he didn't do. Didn't do. But Gallio basically nipped that in the bud and said, these are not crimes or uh, misdemeanors or serious crimes. These are differences that you're having, and I'm not going to get involved in that. And so there were these unjust complaints against Paul, but God was intervening and saying, don't worry, I have people in this town. And he stayed there for 18 months, but then he made this strategic departure and went to Ephesus, and he took Aquila and Priscilla with him. And then he went to the church at Antioch, and he gave a report to his home church. And we concluded last week in verse 23, it said that after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the regions of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening the disciples. So that was the beginning. So last week we concluded with what is really, I wanted to repeat this week, the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey. He went and he spent time back in his home church at Antioch. He reported what God was doing. And after he had done that, then he started off into Galatia and Phrygia in order to reestablish and to encourage the churches that he had planted. Whenever churches are planted, there's going to be opposition from the enemy to the growth that takes place. So if there's opposition, it's often because there's a movement in the right direction. And so Paul wanted to encourage the disciples so that as they're facing spiritual opposition, as they're facing practical opposition, they're strengthened and ready to go. But this review provides an important context as we consider today the critical characteristics of fruitful discipleship. And we begin, begin by looking at the new teacher on the block. 
I'm going to pick up in verses 24 and 25. It says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was eloquent, he was an, eloquent an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now, here we're going to look in, uh, at what's going on with the map about uh, he was a Jew from Alexandria. His name was Apollos, and he was a Jew from Alexandria. And uh, this is on this is Egypt right there. So Alexandria was known as a as an uh, academic center. They had massive libraries. And here's a Jew, and his name was Apollos, which is interesting that he would have the name of a Greek god. So it shows that there was some so maybe some uh, watering down from his parents where they're giving him a, a, the name of a Greek god, but he was there in Alexandria, a place of learning. And so this fellow Apollos, he ends up, uh, uh, next slide please, he ends up uh, in Ephesus where uh, Paul had stopped by in Ephesus, and that is on the, the west coast of Turkey. It's modern day Izmir. And so he went to Ephesus, and there was Priscilla and Aquila. So as Paul left Corinth, and went to Ephesus, obviously Priscilla and Aquila stopped there as Paul continued on around to Syria, Antioch, and back to the home church. But if we look at the next map, we'll see the big scale of things. It's from down there, that's where Apollos was from, and, and Alexandria, and then Jerusalem is there, and then Paul's home church, well, that, that multicultural church at Antioch, and then Ephesus is over there. So Paul and uh, Aquila and Priscilla came back from uh, Corinth went to Ephesus, Priscilla and Aquila stopped there as Paul went back to uh, Antioch, and then Apollos from Alexandria ends up at Ephesus there with Priscilla and Aquila. So that gives you a little bit of the context of what's going on. But as we see this uh, situation, we see that there, Paulus had some real strengths, but he also had some gaps. And so what are the strengths that Apollos had? Well, we see several things that are listed. It says that he was an eloquent man, he was competent, he was fervent, and he was accurate in his teaching. So there are four char characteristics that we see in this new preacher on the block named Apollos. Apollos was faithful with what he had received. P Apollos was communicating fervently the things that he had received. He was eloquent. We see a lot about how he operated. But while he had a lot of gifts and strengths, he was eloquent. And that word eloquent means that he was learned. He was studied. And coming from Alexandria, an academic center, it's not surprising that he was eloquent because he had had the, these massive libraries. He's a Jewish man who had not only the Hebrew scriptures, but Alexandria was the place where the Septuagint was translated as well. And so there was, there was excellent Greek that was spoken there. There was a large community of, of you know, many, many thousands of Jews that lived in Alexandria. And so he was an eloquent man in his ability to communicate. But it says that he was competent. He was strong in the writings of Scripture. It says basically dumagrafe, dunamis, being strong or powerful, grafe in the writings. And so he was strong in the word. He knew how to correctly interpret the word. And so he had the Old Testament Scriptures probably knew not only the Hebrew scriptures, but also the Septuagint, which had been translated into Greek. And so he was competent and strong in the scriptures. But it wasn't just about his academic prowess that was important. It says that he was fervent in the spirit. Fervent, the word translated fervent, means to, to boil with heat. Uh, so metaphorically speaking, he was zealous for what was good. Apollos wasn't just guarding this academic information in his head. He was passionate and zealous as he's communicating this. As we were talking in the adult enrichment class this morning about Laodicea, which was known for being lukewarm, nobody could say any, that Apollos was lukewarm. He was fervent. He was boiling. He was passionate. But he was also accurate in what he was communicating. So he was faithful with what he had. He was the kind of the, the, the natural charismatic person. He was the cream of the crop. But Apollos had some gaps. And Apollos needed those gaps to be filled because it says that he had only knew the baptism of John. He knew about repentance. He knew about the scriptures. 
He knew that the scriptures were pointing to Jesus, and even what he talked about Jesus, as much as he knew about him, was, was accurate. But he had some gaps. He had only received John's baptism, and John's baptism was a water baptism towards repentance. But an encounter with Christ, an authentic encounter with Christ, if we know, recall when John the Baptist said about Jesus, he said, here's a man whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. And so John's baptism was with water towards repentance. The baptism of Jesus with the Holy Spirit is with fire towards the, the fullness of the Spirit. And so there was something that was lacking in this enthusiastic, competent man, Apollos. Nothing but good up to this time, except that his information was incomplete. You know, when you hear something or someone from a distance and you like them, you've never met them, you've heard what they've said, and you like what they say, you're a fan. But if you see or hear someone up close and personal and you love them, then you're, you're a friend. But if you see or hear something or someone up close and personal and commit to them, then you are family. Whether it's coming together in the union of marriage or whether it's, it's, it's the relationship of parents and child. And so there's a fan, there's a, there's a friend, and then there's the commitment of family. And so what we see here is Paul, uh, Apollos had, he was, had the fan status. He was committed to the teachings and to the truth, but he had not had that encounter yet. He, he had some gaps that needed to be filled. And I'd like to ask, what strengths do you have that can be used for God's glory in his kingdom advancement? Because you have strengths, like Apollos had strengths. So what are those strengths that you can use for God's glory in advancing his kingdom? But I'd also like to ask, what are the gaps that you have that need to be filled to increase your kingdom impact for God's glory? We all have strengths, but we all have gaps that need to be fulfilled. If we want to grow, we need to be teachable <coughs> from a standpoint of recognizing what those gaps are and not thinking that we have it all together, but seeking, actively seeking to fill those gaps so that we can be more effective teachers, so that we can take the good that God has given us and leverage it even in an even more effective, positive way. Well, that's the first uh, critical aspect is of looking at that new t teacher on the block is that looking evaluating the strengths and the weaknesses but the second critical characteristics of a fruitful disciple involves maintaining an appropriate balance an appropriate balance between boldness and appropriate balance between humility we pick up in verse 26 and it says talking about apollos it says he began to boldly to speak boldly in the synagogue so Paul is in Ephesus now, big city, important city, and he's boldly speaking in the synagogues. And Priscilla and Aquila heard him, and they took him aside and explained to him the way of the Lord more accurately. Yes, Apollos was using what he had. He had some great skills and some great abilities, eloquent, competent, fervent, and accurate. But when Priscilla and Aquila, who served as tent makers with Paul in Corinth, have gone back to uh, Ephesus, having been chased out of Rome, so now they're back in Ephesus on their home continent of, of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. If you remember, they were from up north in Pontus. And so now they're in Ephesus on the west coast of Turkey, and they're there, and they're hearing this charismatic young preacher, fervent, preaching things that are accurate and true, but they're noticing that something is lacking. So rather than confronting him publicly, they did what was appropriate. They took him to the side. They said, we recognize that you are right with what you're saying. We recognize your gifts and skills and abilities, and we're not going to publicly correct you because what you're saying is lacking, but we're going to pull you to the side. And so we see these positives and these negatives related to the boldness and the humility. And the, 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 the positives about Apollos is that he was available to be used by God right where he was with the information that he had and the strengths and even with the growth edges that he had. But what we see even more so 
is that Apollos, a positive for Apollos is that he walked by faith and not by fear. He was faithful with what he had rather than being fearful about what was lacking. He was faithful and he was, a teach, and he was teachable. And so as, Apollo, as, a, as a Priscilla and Aquila approached him, he was able to learn from them. Now there can be a negative associated with boldness. We don't see this in Apollo, Apollos, but it's one that we need to be aware of. And I, I say this preaching to myself is because one of the negatives of boldness is that assertive, uh, assertiveness can drift towards arrogance. We want to be bold. We want to be doing what God has called us to do. But we need to make sure that in the boldness of doing what God has called us to do is that we don't drift from boldness about having the truth and knowing that we have the truth to being arrogant in our presentation of the truth or arrogant in our attitudes as messengers of the truth. This is a danger. So the positive is faith conquers fear. The danger is that assertiveness can drift towards arrogance. But Apollos was bold and he was teachable. And as Aquila and Priscilla took him to the side, he learned as they made the way more clear to him. He was probably like a lot of people that we see today that might have read the scriptures and studied it. But they haven't experienced the tr heart transformation. They may have grown up in like a, a liberal church where they never really heard the gospel. I spent 20 years of my life in church without knowing the gospel. Then somebody shared it to me, and all of those sovereign foundations came back to, to really accelerate my growth in the Lord. So let us be bold like Apollos was bold, using what he has given us, but also let us be teachable. Let us be humble. Apollos was not only available to be used by God, he was also a teachable. He did not allow his giftedness to suppress his growth in the truth. Because he was teachable, he wanted to learn what Aquila and Priscilla had to say to fill in the gaps that he had. He had a right thinking about Jesus as much as he knew, but there was more that was lacking. Obviously, he lacked the message of the resurrection and the personal faith. He probably studied scripture, knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but didn't understand the implications of his death and his personal needs. But Aquila and Priscilla took him to the side and completed what was lacking. And because they said he only knew the baptism of John, that gives the impression that he wasn't truly converted, but he was a fan. He was on board. And so he's moving from fan to friend to family. And Priscilla and Aquila are helping him to do that. So Apollos is showing humility. And humility has positives and negatives just like boldness has positives and negatives. The positive aspect of humility is that it expands our resource base. If we're humble, then we can learn from a wide variety of sources and we can leverage the experience of others to help us to grow. We can't experience everything, but if we're teachable, we can learn from others who have experienced things. I don't have to be a, a drug addict in the street to learn from a drug addict in the street. And as a matter of fact, I don't want to go through being a drug addict in the street in order to learn lessons like that. And each one of us can, by, by talking with others, can learn and expand through humility. It expands our resource base. But the negative of humility is that there can be sometimes a false humility that can flow from negative or paralyzing insecurities. And sometimes humility and an inappropriate extreme can lead to indecisiveness. If I want to be humble, so I don't want to decide. Or being humble in a negative way, saying I want to be teachable, can lead to being manipulated by, into accepting anything or, or not discerning and evaluating teaching or evaluating character of others. And so while humility has great strengths, if we're not careful, there can be some negative fallouts to an extreme of being insecure, indecisive, or manipulated. But Paul, Apollos wasn't any of those things. He was a man who was exercising both the, the positive aspects of both his boldness and his humility. That's something that each one of us can do, is we can exercise boldness and humility for God's glory, being available, but also being teachable. Now think of a as I was uh, discussing something with Sandra, as we were discussing something from uh, uh, Numbers the other day, we were looking at Miriam and Aaron and their opposition to Moses over him marrying a Cushite woman who was basically a darker-skinned woman. 
and after the death of his wife. But there's an interesting phrase that we were talking about. I can't remember, was it two days ago, something like that? Uh, and it was Numbers uh, 12.3, and it said, Now, the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who are on the face of the earth. That's a strange phrase as his older sister and brother are confronting him about his leadership. So, like, who is he to lead? And it, he's right. He's the baby brother. They'd done some stuff together. Miriam had prophesied in, in a song after they'd gone through the, the Red Sea. Now, Aaron, his track record wasn't so good. That golden calf jumped out of the fire, you know, that he made. But as I was thinking about this, Moses was a man who was bold to lead the people out of Israel because of God's delegated authority. You would think that a man like that wouldn't be described as the meekest man on the face of the earth, but it makes total sense because when you understand the power of the delegated authority by the creator God of the universe, the only normal and natural response would be to be humble because of the direct proximity to the Lord. The reason that Moses was so meek is because he was operating in the supreme delegated authority of God and he was humble because of the direct proximity to God. He spent time with God and he glowed and had to wear a veil over his face because of that proximity. And that's what kept him humble. And we need that balance of holy boldness because of the delegated authority that we have as Christ followers. Christ has risen and conquered the grave. And he has delegated us to be his witnesses. And so we have delegated authority which should evoke great boldness and confidence. And consequently, we should be the meekest of all people, the humblest of all people, as a result of spending time in the presence of God. If we don't spend time in the presence of God, then we'll be, we will be arrogant with the delegated authority from his word. If we don't spend time in the word of God, then we will not be bold even though we spend time in the presence of God because we ignore the delegated authority. That's why we need time in the word and time with the Lord so that we can be bold and humble. What are the areas of your life where you need to grow in order to be a well-balanced disciple of Jesus? You might be well-balanced, but then you just need the encouragement to be more intense in that well-balanced execution of your Christian life in the world around us. Well, this leads to the third critical characteristic of fruitful discipleship, and that involves having a holy ambition. You know, ambition is, is a word that can be evoke a lot of emotion. Oh, it's good to be ambitious or it's bad to be ambitious. It all depends upon what you're saying. But let's read what, uh, what it says in Acts chapter 18, verses 27 and 28. It says, Apollos, when, uh, and when he wished uh, to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that, Christ, that the Christ was Jesus. So now we have a, a few more maps here that show that, um, so, so here he is in, in Ephesus, and then he says he wants to go over to Achaia. And this is the area where you have Corinth and Athens, and this is the southern part of Greece. And so what happens is he wants to go to Achaia <coughs> um, over there. Uh, and then if we could zoom in on, on Achaia and then just to the next map, uh, and that's where Corinth is, is right there. So this is where he's going. So now the brothers there in Ephesus, they write letters of recommendation because here's this new preacher that nobody's heard about. Now he's affirmed that he has the correct doctrine because of the, in, the, the influence of Priscilla and Aquila. And so they write to the churches over there in Achaia saying, this guy is being sent out by us. He's not just somebody who's coming along and saying anything. So they supported him. They encouraged him. As he, wanted, as he had this holy ambition, now that he understood the way more completely, as he understood the gospel of Christ, now he has a holy ambition to go and share further. It's interesting because as he goes back over there, we know that he at least arrived in Corinth because when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he rebukes them for saying, some of you say, I'm a Paul. Others say, I'm of Apollos. So he went over there and he had a powerful ministry. Paul doesn't criticize Apollos even though he hadn't met him. He says, what he did is he's building on what I did. I planted, Apollos watered, but God provides the growth. 
And so, like Paul, Apollos had a holy ambition. Apollos was willing to go. He shared his heart and his vision with others, and others jumped on board. He needed the encouragement and support of his brothers, and we need to encourage and support one another as we live out the holy ambition that God lays on our heart, whether it's a ministry that's outside of this, the walls of this church or whether it's a ministry that goes over outside of the borders of our country, we need to encourage people that have a holy vision and holy ambition to live those out. They provided moral support, encouragement to Apollos, but they also provided that practical support by writing letters of recommendation, something that was very common. But he said, do so in such a way, when they wrote these letters, they said, gladly receive them. Don't welcome them, but gladly and fervently receive them. But Paulus, Apollos wasn't just willing to go. He was willing to help others to grow. We see that the, the interpersonal help that he offered, when he arrived over there, he strengthened the believers. He strengthened them in the faith and grace that he had experienced. The enduring hope that they need to have when they're under attack in a hostile world. Because remember, Corinth was a rough place. But he also not only offered interpersonal help by encouraging the believers as he went over there he provided apologetic help he refuted powerfully refuted the jews in public showing from scripture remember that relates back to how he handled scripture eloquent competent fervent accurate he took all of those skills before he was a believer completed them after he was a believer and now is reproducing them as he's uh, powerfully refuting the jews in public showing that christ is jesus he helped to refute, he encouraged not only the believers by saying, hey, you can go forward, but this is how you can do it. And he showed them and he modeled apologetics, defending the faith. He vehemently empowered refute, and refuted the non-believers. He refuted through good conversations, but he also modeled to the believers how they could do the same thing. It says powerfully refuted. Those two words together provide a very strong combination because powerful is talking about vehemently, mightily defending the faith, but he refuted them. He basically proved outright that Christ is Jesus. He is the Messiah. The good news is for us is that we have the tools accessible to us to refute powerfully the lies of the world and the truth and to, and, and to promote the truth of the gospel. I hope that each one of you as Christ followers have a holy ambition for how God can use you and your sphere of influence. It doesn't have to be massive, but let your ambition, but have ambition to be used by God and the capacity that he can use you. You might think that you have a small capacity, but he can multiply that in ways that you never imagined. And if you have a great capacity, may you be humble enough to see that limited in how it's used, but it can be used powerfully as well. So let us have the balance of humility and boldness as we pursue the holy ambition. And may we use Apollos as an example of one who was willing to go and willing to help others to grow and to multiply himself through other people. You know, missionaries to the Muslim world labored for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years with little fruit. But they prepared the ground for the harvest that we're seeing in the last couple of decades. May you be encouraged to live out your call in holy ambition. And may you be teachable so that you might be a teacher that can have an impact in the lives of others. Whether it's leading a person to faith in Christ or helping a person to grow in Christ through discipleship. This is God's call for us as his people. May we live into that. Let us pray. Lord, thank you.